Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Marina Ichan, COO, and with me, as always, is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communication. So, Tim, the governor has been going around the state, as Tim, you like to call, made for TV speeches on his agenda in lieu of the traditional State of the State address. So he talked about improving public safety, which by all accounts sounds to me like he wants to begin to convert San Quentin into more of a rehabilitation facility rather than the the prison for for hardened criminals that it is now. I'm not sure if that's going to deter crime, but we'll see. The second thing he wanted to do is uh, wanted to create 1,200 tiny homes at a cost of a billion dollars to help ease a homeless crisis in the state. And the last two issues, which I think we're going to go through now, is he's been highlighting reforming the way the state deals with with mental health. And and finally. He wants to jumpstart his program, which I believe he introduced two, three years ago, on creating a drug label for the state, starting with with insulin. So how about we start with this mental health proposal? So the governor wants to raise at least $3 billion through a bond measure in, in 2024 to fund the construction of new mental health campuses, residential settings, supportive housing. He also wants to redirect another $1 billion in funds into uh, annually from a from an existing income tax on on top earners to operate uh, the facilities. So what he thinks he's going to get out of it is about ten thousand additional beds. So the state faces a shortage of, of 6,000 beds right now. So his his goal is to raise about 3 to $5 billion from this bond measure. You know, Tim, this all sounds fun on paper, but the problem, as we know, is that we have to be able to compel people to, to seek treatment programs. And last year, the, the legislature passed Newsom's program to treat those with severe mental illnesses known as care courts. Unfortunately, the plan, a little background on care courts, is that a family member or a social worker or or um, someone of authority is able to go to court and ask that the court force someone who is severely mentally ill to seek treatment. And, and that's passed, but it's uh, it's being challenged by in the courts from the civil rights group. So I don't know where that's going. So, you know, if you if you build all of these facilities and you can't compel people to seek mental health treatment, then there's just no use. You're going to be right back on the streets again. That's right. That's the key thing with all of this. What will the court decide? And we've seen from what they've uh, ruled in the Boise versus Martin case, which I think you could argue that has been one of the main uh, factors in causing this explosion of homelessness. You can't really compel people to go against their will, even though, you know, the kinds of things that Newsom is talking about, those are the steps in the right direction that are Wayne Weingarten and Carrie Jackson have identified in our No Way Home book as things that we need to be doing. I guess I look at the governor's plan and it seems to me like everything that he proposes. We're throwing billions of dollars at something and hoping it sticks. You know, I see this three-ish, four-ish billion dollars that we he wants to spend here in the bond measure. You know, we're going to have, obviously, you know, debt payments added to the budget to pay for the bond over its lifetime. And if we're adding 10,000 beds at a, w- with that money that we hope to, that's a lot of money per bed. You know, are we really getting our money's worth out of, out of these bond measures? So, so it, it just seems to me kind of the, the, the same old thing from Newsom. You know, it's well-meaning, but we're just throwing a lot of money at a problem and hoping that does something. His other proposal is not just throwing a lot of money uh, on something, but actually creating a new government entity, a new, well, California is going to be providing its own drug label, and he's starting off with, with insulin. Um, so now the state will be in the business of producing insulin, Tim. So they've contracted with a drug maker who is in charge with finding a manufacturer to create these drugs at a probably a lower price than most drug makers are doing now. So all know what happens when government tries to undercut the private sector, then you start to diminish competition. Down the line, if you see government continue to undercut private businesses and manufacture its own products, such as this insulin, we might see 
start to see shortages going forward. And I would direct any of our listeners who are interested in learning more about this, you know, our Sally Pipes and our Wayne Weingarten have done a lot of work on this issue through our Center for Medical Economics and Innovation. And they make the point, you know, these these all sound so well-intentioned, but these types of programs, uh, what they do ultimately is reduce access to the availability of life-saving medications, remove the incentive for drug makers to take the risk to make new life-saving treatments. So there, there are real downsides. It sounds wonderful on television and Gavin Newsom can give a wonderful soundbite and, and, and all of that, but there are real downsides to this type of policy. And this is only the first one. He said in his announcement that he wants to manufacture naloxone, which is one of the drugs um, used to uh, address the fentanyl crisis. Well, that's already a crisis. We don't need to make the crisis even worse through the, these types of, uh, of efforts that aren't going to result in the availability of affordable treatment for uh, people who are in need. So it's a very um, troubling path that we're going down on this issue in California. Yeah, and that's just a, kind of a, an introduction to our podcast guest, Wayne Weingarten, who is our PRI Senior Fellow in Business and Economics. And as many of our listeners know, he's an economist and he's going to be addressing some of these issues as well as discussing his new study that's out. It's called the 50 State Charity Index. And what Wayne does is kind of a neat thing. I don't think anyone's ever done it is he looks at the 50 states in terms of their regulation on charities. Actually, PRI is uh, considered a, a charity. We are a nonprofit, but there are also other charities out there, homeless shelters who who are under the regulatory arm of, of the state. And charities contribute tremendously to our economy. And we've done these rankings before, especially for small businesses. But we thought that we would uh, do the same for, for charities who uh, try and assess whether we need to lighten the regulatory burden on charities so that they can do their job and serve the communities that we live in. And of course, when we have someone as versatile as Wayne on the podcast, we couldn't chat with them without diving into some of the other hot economic topics facing in California and the country today. So we begin our discussion talking about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and what it means for the economy. We talk about President Biden's budget plan. We talk about the um, governor's uh, homeless plan, his plan that we talked about uh, previously to create tiny homes. And then we also talk about the governor's windfall profits tax or uh, approach on, uh, on oil companies uh, to deal with so-called price gouging. So a lot of very topical issues that we discuss. So you buckle up. You're going to learn a lot in uh, this episode this week. Thanks so much for listening. And here's Wayne Weingarten. Wayne, we're so happy to have you on today to talk about your new study, a ranking of the best and worst states for charity regulations, which you produced in partnership with the Philanthropy Roundtable. But with so much going on in the news recently, we couldn't have you on without talking about the economy. So the news has been dominated by the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and concerns about the health of, of the U.S. banking system. We've heard everything from pension funds to venture capital to housing construction projects that create a lot of jobs will be negatively impacted. So what's your takeaway from the bank's collapse and, and what do you think the impact will be on the economy uh, in the short and long term? Well, there are serious consequences uh, that the collapse of uh, Silicon Valley Bank is going to have, you know, as well as Credit Suisse. They had a near collapse, and so the Swiss authorities had to have UBS um, shore them up, and we've had Signature Bank. Uh, you know, in the latest news, right, Silicon Valley Bank, they kind of forced a marriage uh, with First Citizens Bank, which now has picked up SVB. Uh, but the bottom line is there are serious consequences to that collapse, both in the short term and in the long term. This demonstrates the real problem we have with how we're conducting monetary policy. You have to remember that while we're feeling the effects now through the collapse of SVB and the other banks, the seeds for all of these problems were set a decade ago when the Fed keeps expanding its balance sheet, buying all of these assets, keeping interest rates at 0%. When you distort interest rates to the extent that they have done, the consequences we're seeing now are the result. So it's really important to remember that while we're seeing it now, the, the problem happened, the stage was set a long time ago. 
in the short term, what we're going to see is it's going to worsen the economic outcome. Credit is going to become tighter so that small businesses are going to be hurt. They're going to have a much harder time getting loans. All of this is, is, a, is a negative in terms of what's the economic outlook. Are we going to face a recession? This collapse means the odds of, of having a recession are much higher. And then long term, the impact is even worse because we establish rules for how to, to deal with these situations in an orderly manner that keeps the incentives correct. It doesn't have this problem of moral hazard that we create when we have privatized gains and socialized losses. And when we guaranteed all of the deposits at uh, Silicon Valley Bank, what we basically said to Silicon Valley, right, some of the most you know, wealthiest people in the country, that while if your idea makes a uh, billion dollars, you get to keep it. But God forbid you might lose 10% on an uninsured deposit. We have to have that backed up by the, by the government, ultimately by taxpayers. Capitalism doesn't work if you have privatized gains and socialized losses. We need capitalism. We need free markets. That includes private losses and private gains. And as we continue to go down this road, we're just undermining the, the vibrancy of our economy with these just ad hoc responses every time we have a banking crisis, which, as I said, is created by the government itself. So in the midst of all of these banking issues and our financial crisis, President Biden has proposed a massive $6.8 trillion federal budget for the 2024 fiscal year, which includes both big tax and spending increases and some very troubling proposals on prescription drugs and green subsidies, among other issues. So what are some of your key takeaways from the Biden spending plan and what impact do you think it will have on inflation and the health of the economy? Well, the direct impact is is going to be very minimal, right? Because his budget is going to be dead on arrival in the House. And thank God we have divided government uh, because if this were to be, if this spending block were to occur, what we're doing is we're undermining our, our, our long-term financial viability. It's going to add increasing pressures on inflation. So at the exact time that the Federal Reserve is doing what's right, it's trying to rein in the money supply to control inflation. Uh, if Biden's budget were passed, that would add to the fiscal problems. That's going to add to inflationary pressures. It's also going to continue to undermine uh, our, our the vibrancy of our economy because it's taking more capital from the productive private sector and bringing it into the government sector. It's going to require higher taxes. And so all of that's going to reduce our underlying growth path. So there's a lot of uh, really concerning trends if this budget were to pass on or if the if the house isn't going to actually stand up to this ever encroaching growth in government remember historically government spending has been it's been too much but it's been around 20 21 percent of the economy in recent years it's grown to 25 percent and that's where president biden's budget is trying to keep it there are long-term consequences uh, for our future prosperity keeping uh the government spending at that high of a rate now Historically, we also only have 18% of our economy is taxes. I say only, but that's an excessive amount as well. But it certainly lags how much we've been spending. That's why we have constant debts and deficits. Well, we've really expanded that. So now our debt problem is only going to get worse. And that is going to create more political crises and more volatility, something we certainly don't need to see. So there's the the logic behind his budget is very disconcerting. The good news is we have divided government and hopefully the uh, the Republicans will create some sort of fiscal sanity uh, and, and rein in what is just a blatantly unaffordable and on, it's an unserious budget because it's a budget that your your five year old kid will would put down. You know, he wants the ice cream to stay up late and all of the things that are bad for him, and isn't willing to eat his spinach. And and unfortunately, we're at a time where we really need to start eating our spinach. So meanwhile, here in California, Governor Newsom has recently been traveling the state, giving a series of made for TV speeches on on various topics in lieu of uh, the traditional state of the state address. So one of the areas that um, has caught our interest is his plan to spend another $1 billion to, to build 1,200 tiny homes across the state. So it seems like more of the same approach from his Project Home Key initiative, which you and Carrie Jackson have written quite a bit about. Uh, what are your overall thoughts on the governor's proposal? I, I think you summed it up with just the idea it's more of the same. Right. The, you know, we're going to continue to put more and more money at the same programs. So we're going to throw more money at the same programs as if it's the amount of money we're spending 
that's the problem, not that maybe what we're doing is is the wrong approach. I mean, you have to remember, we spent, what, 10, almost $15 billion over the last several years on homelessness uh, programs. And as we spend that much money, we've seen homeless, a number of homeless people in California, it's gone from about 150, 151,000 in 2019 to over 170,000, almost 170, actually almost 172,000 today. So while we've been spending tens of billions of dollars on this approach that the government uses, it's referred to as housing first, where we keep converting all of the hotels and motels into more homeless uh, housing, we spend more money, but we're not reducing the number of homeless. We're actually, it's increasing. And so it, it, the governor keeps saying his program is a success. It just, it's hard to fathom. How is it a success when we keep seeing the number of homeless grow, the problem expands, the costs of this problem continues to uh, to impact all of California. So there's, uh, it, it, the program is undoubtedly a failure. And one of the things that Terry and I have been saying, obviously we need to spend money, right? This is something that requires resources, undoubtedly, but we need to do a better job. We need to look at how do we better provide services? How do we focus on what are the driving causes of homelessness? And for a lot of people, we're talking about mental health issues. We're talking about drug addiction. We need to address those things first. And we need to address them by having both carrots and sticks. We need to actually uh, look at our, our definition of, of what is actually considered a felony for, for stealing. And we need to actually say, if you steal $900 worth of goods, that is a felony. And then we need to use that opportunity to say, if you have a drug addiction, instead of going to jail, we're going to sentence you to uh, actual treatment, drug you know, addiction treatment. And hopefully, by taking this approach, we're going to address the root causes that are driving the homelessness problem, as opposed to this idea that if we just put somebody in a home, that somehow magically all their problems will disappear, which is really the approach we're taking now. Throwing billions of dollars at the problem won't solve it. Using private charities, being innovative, treating the root causes, and eliminating the policies that encourage homelessness, that's the approach we need to take. Uh, it will require resources, but just throwing resources at the same old approach is just a recipe for further increases in the problem. So another proposal that the governor has been pushing in recent months is his so-called windfall profits tax against oil companies. And he's, you know, gone around the state accusing them of price gouging. And his initial proposal, which was a windfall profits tax, whatever that may be, didn't get much traction in the legislature. So now he's come back with a new plan that would basically empower the California Energy Commission to be the, the judge, jury, and executioner of what are maximum profits and levy penalties, they find any, quote, price gouging. So what are your thoughts on the, the new proposal? And basically, in general, what will the, what does this kind of effort do, if anything, to um, the availability and affordability of oil and gas in California? This is just a lose, lose, lose policy in any way you look at it. Uh, if, if you take it just directly for what it is, right, you, you're imposing a tax on oil and profit companies if, uh, by your arbitrary definition, they make too much money. So one, you're creating a, an arbitrary kind of capricious judgment into the uh, kind of tax system and to how government regulates. Uh, and that sends a very negative signal, not just to oil and gas, but more broadly. Now, you know, if you make too much money in California, you know, you might actually get those profits taxed away. That's not the way to incentivize more innovation uh, across all sectors, but specifically in the oil and gas. So this, you know, from a growth perspective, this is horrible. From a consumer perspective, if you raise taxes on the oil and gas companies, those taxes inevitably get shared. So some of that might fall on the on their balance sheet of the, of the big oil companies. They'll make less money. Apparently, that's the goal. At the same time, some of that's going to find its way to uh, the price of gasoline. So in the name of gas prices being too high, <laughs> we're going to raise gas prices. It's just, it's, it's insane. It makes no sense. Um, it's also problematic from the sense that gas prices are high in California because of the policies that California has implemented. So as opposed to actually asking the question, are all of these regulatory costs that require special uh, gasoline just for California that 
can create all sorts of supply issues. Uh, and that's what's actually driving the prices, as opposed to kind of trying to understand that and change that process. We're just going to slap on another disincentive. Again, it's just going to make the whole market more inflexible. It's going to make it more rigid, uh, create more supply constraints. So uh, anytime there's some sort of volatility in the oil markets, and we know oil markets are subject to volatility, that's going to be amplified in the uh, in, in the California market. So we're going to have more volatility in the future because of this policy. And then there's, again, when I was talking about arbitrariness, how do you know a profit is um, excessive or not? And do you take a multi-year view? Everyone keeps talking about how high oil profits are, but they forget that there was no profits. There were losses for the oil companies uh, during the COVID lockdown. And that wasn't their fault, right? They didn't create COVID. So these oil companies, uh, for no fault of their own, lost billions of dollars. And so if we're going to have an excess profit tax, does that mean we need to have an excess loss subsidy? Or maybe the excess profit needs to be over a couple of years, in which case there are no excess profits. So, you know, it's it's that type of arbitrariness that's really troubling in terms of this as a policy. And, and, and that's going to bleed over into our, our, our broader environment and just make California that much more business unfriendly. It's, it's a really unfortunate policy. Thanks for your thoughts on those issues, Wayne. So now let's turn to your study. People may not realize just how big an impact that nonprofits have in their communities. So whether it's an after-school program or, or homeless shelter or even a think tank like PRI, nonprofits are, are literally improving people's lives every day. As your study shows, good work is actually negatively impact when charities have to spend so much money and time and manpower complying with government regulation. So pay a 30,000 foot view picture for us, just how impactful are local nonprofits to our communities and how much do regulations negatively impact our daily work? Well, the, the nonprofits are incredibly helpful. I mean, we were talking about the homelessness crisis here in California. And what all of our research has shown is that most of the best shelters, the shelters that not only help people just in their immediate need of being off the street, but in long term, helping them transition back to society, transition to having a home and a job. The private nonprofit charities do a much better job of actually spending that money well and helping people transition from homelessness to uh, to being back in society. Um, and that's and that's why w- w- one of the things we think uh, Governor Newsom should be doing is supporting the nonprofits and having them serve as the shelters rather than run the ineffective government shelters. Uh, and that's not just for homelessness when you're talking about uh, dealing with awful diseases um, or dealing with, you know, think tanks, things that we do. You know, nonprofits play an indispensable role uh, in so many areas of kind of our of our lives. Uh, and, and the federal tax code recognizes this. This is why uh, nonprofits are exempt from, from income taxes, because we want to encourage that type of activity. Taxes discourage, when you tax something, you discourage it. So you don't tax it because we don't want to discourage these activities. Uh, and the same thing goes with regulations. The, the, the regulations have value when they promote transparency, when they promote accountability, and they impose the least amount of costs to get those outcomes. Um, but when those uh, costs to um, increase and you don't get more transparency, you don't get more accountability, but your costs of compliance increase, then when that balance is wrong, the ability of charities to, to do this important work goes down. And I think what's most troubling is that it's always the smaller organizations, in this case, the smaller nonprofits, which are about 90% of all charities, by the way, they're going to be the ones that are impacted the most. Uh, and so they're going to be the ones whose activities are discouraged the most, and, and and that's troubling. So before we drill down into the results, what were your main goals when you set out to look at the regulatory environment for charities in each state? And what are some of the regulatory burdens that you measure in each state? The reason we, we Eve, took this up is we've done a lot of work looking at regulations of small businesses. And one of the things we, we came to realize is in all that literature, and there's a lot of people writing about that, so little attention is paid on the not-for-profit sector. So while we worry about how regulations affect uh, large businesses and small businesses that are for profits, we don't really see that with respect to nonprofits. And so the goal really was to, to, to provide an initial assessment and get a conversation started so that we can start asking the question, are regulations at the state and federal level as well, are they promoting or hindering 
the charitable sector? And to the extent that they're hindering, what changes can we make so that we get more charitable work? Which is really, I think, a goal that anyone, you know, right, center, or left should be able to get behind. In terms of kind of what issues, we really wanted to look at what, what are the startup costs? What type of audit requirements are, are there? Are there annual filing requirements, annual fees and charges? What about paid solicitors, which some uh, charities find very valuable in terms of uh, raising the revenues? What type of rules and restrictions are there? Uh, to me, a very important one. Uh, and I didn't realize this until I started digging into the question. Uh, some states don't allow charities to exempt their purchases from state sales taxes. And that can become a very large tax burden or a very important cost savings that helps charities operate. So uh, are charitable purchases exempt from sales taxes? It's those types of questions that we try to go across all the states and get a sense of where do the states uh, lay out relative to one another on all those types of issues. So Wayne, based on your research, what states did you find to have the best regulatory environments for, for starting and operating a charity? And which ones were the worst? Uh, and were there any surprises in your rankings? Well, the, the five best states were, um, just to list them off, uh, Montana, uh, Wyoming, Nebraska, Delaware, and Idaho. Uh, the worst ones were Connecticut, Mississippi, New Jersey, Florida, and Pennsylvania. And to me, Florida being one of the worst states was really a surprise. Uh, typically, in most business rankings, they rank very well because they do have a very business-friendly environment, but some of the regulations that they impose um, are just are, are more burdensome from charities. The startup costs are higher. They have uh, stringent audit requirements, uh, filing requirements. All of those things are just are, are just more difficult in Florida. And to me, that was probably the biggest surprise uh, that we found. So when the average person hears that a charity, for example, has to pay several hundred dollars in fees, you know, they might think that this really isn't that big a deal. But as you paint the picture in your study, these regulations, however small, are hugely impactful on the ability of a charity to fulfill their mission. So share with us some examples of how state regulations like this one, for example, you know, are particularly burdensome for charity. Well, again, I think we have to go back to the idea that most charities, about 90%, um, are small. They have less than $500,000 a year of, of, of a total budget. So they that, that's all the money they have to to. Uh, meet their, you know, in, in altruistic endeavor, uh, many of which are very important. Again, you know, helping the homeless or uh, helping people with a, a disease, kind of that disease community group that provides incredible support to people who are dealing with very difficult things in their lives. Now, if you're going to tell that charity that they need to have an annual audit, that's an independent audit. Well, the research shows that could be between ten and twenty thousand dollars. So if you're asking a small charity to spend two to four percent of their budget every year just to conduct an audit. And that doesn't even include the amount of time that you need to spend uh, to conduct the audit, to go through the, uh, uh, the different accounting with your independent uh, accountant. All of those factors aren't included in that figure either. So you can really have a meaningful impact on uh, the ability of a small organization to fulfill their mission. And, and that goes beyond the audit requirement too. That's if you have to comply with all of these different regulations, that takes time. Uh, that time is can't be devoted to the charitable mission. It's devoted to working with bureaucrats. Uh, if you're a small charity that hasn't started up, hasn't you know, it isn't operating yet, you know, a two hundred dollar startup fee can seem like it's de minimis. But if you're barely making ends meet, and you know, as an independent individual, but you want to start a charity, that could be a, a, a huge discouragement from even forming. Uh, just because, you know, you don't really have that extra money in your budget. So th there's a lot of requirements that can seem de minimis from kind of a macro perspective or if you're a large charity, but for a small one, that can be particularly damaging. So Wayne, some will, will look at your results and say that's not a bad thing that charities have to comply with a lot of regulations because it ensures accountability to donors and more transparency in the work of the charities. So based on the results of your study, what's your message to them? I, I, we're certainly not saying that they should be unregulated. And I think really what we're looking for, we're asking the question about is, is there a optimal if I can use that term, uh, regulatory environment. Um, I mean, one of the things we found when we related the rankings that we have uh, to the vibrancy of the charitable sector. And so what we said is each state should have similar number of charities if you adjust for 
uh, the size of the state, uh, the population, its economy. So we we said, okay, look at it per billion dollars of state GDP. And if there's marked differences in the number of charities, and that relates to the regulations, that that, that maybe there is something to this that we need to look into um, how do regulations, are, if we're over-regulating, then we're putting on too much cost onto the charities relative to the benefits of transparency and accountability that we want to see the regulations promote. And what we found is, in fact, that there was a, a big difference, particularly in the top third of our rankings compared to the rest of the states, whereas the top third had about 15% more charities per billion dollars of GDP uh, relative to uh, the bottom third. So that there seems to be an optimal amount of uh, regulatories, uh, regulatory burdens that promotes transparency, promotes accountability. And if you go too far beyond, you're actually imposing an excessive burden that takes away or reduces the vibrancy of the charitable sector. And remember, we're also looking at this as a relative comparison, but there are also impacts that are unknown. We, hopefully more research can be done into this. What's the absolute impact? Because maybe everyone is regulating too much, just some are regulating uh, excessively compared to others. We were really looking at that comparative uh, impact, but there are very possible absolute impacts that we need to understand so we can get that regulatory environment right. So looking ahead, what are some of the reforms that you would like state lawmakers in the worst states for charities to consider to make their states more hospitable for charities? And what are some of the things that lawmakers in these states should be doing to reverse these troubling trends and instead make their states more welcoming for individuals? to start and grow nonprofit? I think a very uh, a great place to start is in, in the states that require charities to pay sales taxes. So uh, our California being one of them, uh, they, they should consider exempting uh, charities from paying sales taxes. You know, in, in California, there's taxes, or you're going to increase the cost of all of the taxable goods the charity needs to operate by 10%. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a lot of money. So uh, if you state, if state that don't exempt charities from the sales tax, uh, they, they should absolutely consider exempting those. Uh, another big cost item that is worth focusing on is the audit requirements. Uh, where they do exist, you know, we need to ask questions. Do, do, is an annual audit required or would a biannual audit be sufficient. So you don't need to go through those exempts, uh, those costs and expenses every year. You can do it every other year. Uh, really look at the revenue threshold. Most states have some sort of revenue threshold where you don't need to conduct an, uh, a full audit or an independent audit if you're below a certain number. And we need to evaluate, is, is that threshold set at the right level? Perhaps it needs to be higher so that, uh, you know, under a million or whatever, whatever the number is, um, those, all of those charities would be exempt. And you're really only focusing that audit requirement on the largest charitable organizations who, one, probably need more oversight and, two, have the resources in order to, to perform those more cost effectively. And then I think the other thing which is really important is looking at the startup regulations. I think we really want to streamline uh, those um, the charities that are just getting started are going to be the ones that are most vulnerable. Um, they're going to be the ones that have the least resources. Um, and often the person or people who are starting it will already have to be working because the charity obviously isn't operating, so you can't be paying them a salary. So I think we really want to help the charities that are operating on a shoestring as much as possible and really streamline and, and minimize the regulations because as in most parts of you know the economy, Often the best ideas come from the startups. And so we really want to uh, encourage that type of innovation in the charitable sector. And, and we can do that by um, eliminating uh, different obstacles, delays, uh, as well as the, the costs. I mean, do we really need that $200? Um, that can be material to a, a, a small charity and it's pretty immaterial in terms of the budget. So uh, looking at those types of, of regulations and really trying to streamline those costs for starting up a charity could be very important in getting the new concepts out there. Thanks so much, Wayne. Thank you. It's always great to be here. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.